This is the FlipNerd.com Expert Real Estate Investing Show, the show for real estate investors. Whether you're a veteran or brand new, I'm your host, Mike Hambright, and each week I bring you a new expert guest that will share their knowledge and lessons with you. If you're excited about real estate investing, believe in personal responsibility, and taking control of your life and financial destiny, you're in the right place. This is episode number 358, and my guest for today's show is Tom Caffarella, a Boston-based real estate investor. Today, we talk about generating motivated seller leads. We talk about what's working, and we talk about what's not. More than ever, it's critical that your advertising dollars are working for you every single day as every penny counts. Today, we talk about direct mail, online advertising, and something that's becoming more and more popular, actually cold calling seller prospects to see if they're interested in selling their house. Whether you're brand new or a veteran, I promise you're going to learn a lot from today's show. So let's go ahead and get started. Please help me welcome Tom Caffarella to the show. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this. And, and we talk about lead generation all the time. Um, but not always on the show. And, uh, you know, I think you and you and I were talking before the show, we both know that it's a different world now than it was five, six years ago from a lead generation standpoint. I mean, you'd, you'd agree with that, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, when I first, I was really lucky. I got starting in the business about 10 years ago, literally probably the day the market started crashing. So <laughs> when I first started, I thought real estate investing was you go on the MLS, you find a, a HUD owned property or a bank owned property, you put it under contract, you put some money into it and you make some money. And I did that for a while. I did that for five or six years until somewhere around 2012, the market completely shifted. And yeah. it shifted overnight where there were 50 homes that were being auctioned or um, HUD properties like in the specific city I was doing a lot of business in overnight that went in half. And I went through a period where pretty much every deal I did either lost money or I barely made anything until mm. I figured out that I needed to, to make a change. And that's when I started marketing to sellers directly and my business completely changed once I figured that out. Yeah. Yeah. And so I have a lot of friends that were, so where I'm at in, you're in Boston, right? So I'm in Dallas. So mm -hmm. REOs were never big here. They just were never a big thing, at least for me. I mean, I've, I bought like three or four HUD houses out of hundreds of properties, three or four HUD properties, and they were kind of flukes. They were not, weren't my best deals. Like we always have been going direct to seller, but I have friends mm -hmm. that were buying at auction, like heavy, heavy at auction, REOs, lots of things. And for those people that never went direct to seller, which has its challenges we're going to talk about today. But if if you had you were a one legged stool in a lot of regards, like and that went away for everybody at some point, no matter what your kind of no matter what your medicine was there, like that, that went away at some point and people had to figure out a new a new way to operate. Yeah, and I at that point my business got completely taken away from me. So yeah. I went from making really good money every single year to not knowing if I was going to be able to survive in, in that particular, you know, market. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing about once you figure out how to go direct to seller, which we're going to be talking a lot about today, um, there, you know, we buy houses in distress. There's always people that defer maintenance on their house for decades. And, and then eventually somebody has to deal with that. And a lot of times the person that lived there for decades didn't deal with it. So why would they deal with it all of a sudden after 30 or 40 years? Right. So they're, they're, those are yeah. likely investor type sales. And there's always death, divorce, inheritance, like lots of things that happen in people's lives that are going to happen in all of our lives eventually it's just a matter of you know how our assets will be taken care of at that point will the family just say i don't like i'm knocking on wood here i don't want anything to happen to my parents but if something were to happen to my parents i grew up in illinois like i'm not going to go up there and fool with that i just want it to go away like tomorrow and so uh, there it, we provide a service for that right Absolutely. And there's many other reasons. I mean, you hit on kind of the most common ones, but there are so many different reasons why it might make sense for a particular seller to sell to an investor. And until you actually start marketing directly to motivated sellers, you don't realize it. Now, right. the majority of sellers, over 90% of sellers are always going to sell traditionally. They're going to get their house ready for sale. They're going to list it with a real estate agent. They're going to want top dollar for their home. 
and they're going to be willing to go through the hassles and headaches that accompany having a property listed. But that 10% of the population doesn't want to deal with all that. They want to sell directly to an investor and they want to be done 30, 45 days later without any hassles or contingencies. And those are the people that we serve. And so it's the right, right option for those particular, that segment of the population. Right, right. Yeah. Well, before we kind of get any further, tell us a little bit more. You, talk, you talked about how you changed gears and under, you kind of mm -hmm. came into the understanding of the importance of generating leads yourself for, from motivated sellers. But give us a little bit more of an introduction uh, to kind of how you got started in the business or and kind of how you've evolved. Yeah. So I got started in the business, like I said, about 10 years ago, and I was a CPA. So I had a full-time corporate job, I, which I absolutely hated. So I would go to work every single <laughs> – so I'd go to work every single day. I'd read about real estate investing. I'd daydream about doing fix and flips and buy and holds and wholesaling. And I got my real estate brokerage license. And it wasn't actually until I had some a seller that did not want to list their home that actually wanted to sell directly to an investor – that I figured out that this, you know, subset sub segment of the market existed. And that was actually my first deal that I ever did. And mm. I wholesaled that deal, did really well on it. And there was no looking back after that. Yeah. Yeah. Once you, it's interesting, uh, as I say, it's about all real estate investors, a big part of success that I teach people is, is just the confidence. Right. And after you see it happen once, mm. then you're like, there's like something in the back of your head that always wonders, is this really real? But once oh, you see it happen once, you're kind of like, it's like, it's like blood in the water and you're a shark, right? It's like, I'm all in now, right? <laughs> even if you see everybody else doing it, and even if you see, you know, a friend of yours that, that says they made a lot of money, like you, always in the back of your head, you're like, can I, can I really do this? Does this really happen? And yeah. most of the people that I talk with that are looking to get, you know, into this, they're always like, well, why would somebody take less than fair market value for their home? And I can list all the reasons, but until you actually see it, it's hard to believe that somebody, because like we look at it from our perspective, like would we take a discount on our home? I probably wouldn't. But right. again, there's that segment of the population that would, and those are the people that it makes sense to for us to serve, and that's how we make our living. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of people just don't really understand that that there are definitely people that are not motivated by money or it's not the primary motivator. Yeah. Some people just want yeah. the pain to go like what this could be pain associated. Like a family member could have died and that house reminds them of them. It could, you could have like been abused as a child and that's where your dad lived or whatever. There's lots of reasons. I mean, there's a million reasons, but sometimes people just want that problem to go away as fast as possible. And it has nothing to do with money. And I think until you I, kind I of, think we had so you have people had, explain um, their so situation to you and tell you their story, and you're like, I, I understand. But until you, like you said, until you've experienced that yourself, uh, people just don't get it usually. So, I, I've even had people where they just don't want their neighbors to know they're they're selling their house. Simple as right. that. Yeah. And right. they, they don't want they don't want people going through their house. They, they, they don't want to have open houses. They don't want the public to know that they're selling, and they're willing to sell to an investor because of that. So it doesn't always even have to be this extreme situation. It can be something simple that they just want a fast and easy sale and that's all they need and that's all we need and we get the deal done. Yep, yep, awesome. So let's talk a little bit about how things evolved from, let's just go back even five years, like 2011, 2012, up until today, because there's been a big shift mm -hmm. in the market uh, across the country. Every market's a little bit different, but talk about, I guess, the shift that occurred and maybe a little bit about um, the shift that occurred with you, like some of the things that you realized and, and, and what forced you to change. So what happened was, is that when, when there became less dist distressed inventory on the market, there were the same amount of investors who wanted to flip homes. So simple supply and demand, the prices started getting pushed up. And even as the economy started doing better, labor costs started to go up. So where we could buy a property directly on the MLS or adding auction and make money, we couldn't anymore. And so again, my back was against the wall. You know, I needed to figure out a way for this to work. I did not want to go back to corporate America, which was my biggest kind of fear and what motivated me. So we started, we literally tested out pretty much every marketing method that you can think of. 
So if you go on bigger pockets and you you search, you know, and you know, motivated seller marketing methods, you know, you'll find 40, 50, 60 things. We were lucky because we had enough money to spend to test each and every one of them out. And then all we did was the ones that worked, we did more of, and the things that didn't work, we did less of. Hmm. So we went through about a six month to a year phase where we tried a lot of things that didn't work. And, um, you know, some, the thing about like marketing to motivated sellers is that it can even be specific to your geographic location. Like certain yeah. things can work in one market and they might not work in another. Like for example, in my market, in the Boston market, if you put a, up, a, up a bandit sign, it's gonna get ripped down within the hour. So it doesn't work in Boston, but I talk to people all over the country in, in different markets and in some markets you can put a bandit sign up and it stays up for a year. So, <laughs> right. you know, even, even, even within a specific geographic market, like certain things might work better than others, but in general, there's only a few things that work really well across all markets. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the things you tried there that uh, other than maybe band signs that just didn't work for you that you thought maybe to talk about, it sounds like you tried a lot, but try the ones that you kind of yeah. knew in your mind, this is going to work. And then just, it didn't work. Are you looking to change your life through real estate investing? If you're interested in either getting started or taking your business to the next level, please check out Flip Nerd's private program at theinvestormachine.com. This is the most robust real estate investor coaching, networking, and mastermind on the planet and designed for your success. If you're ready to roll up your sleeves, ready to take personal responsibility for your own success, and ready to dive into a world-class instructional coaching program that provides you step-by-step -step instruction to help you achieve financial freedom, then you should apply today. Spaces are limited and candidates are only considered after an application and interview process. Our 12-month investor program is unparalleled. Think you might be a fit? Learn more today at theinvestormachine.com. This is going to work and then just it didn't work. <laughs> so the banding signs was a big one because I feel like every single course I ever took to learn about real estate investing taught about how great banding signs were. So we developed a really good system where we were getting, we had multiple people putting them up, myself included. We would get up at like four o'clock in the morning, get them all out. And again, they were just getting ripped down and ripped down and ripped down. And not that we didn't get any leads from it, but when you actually calculate out the cost per lead, it was yeah. extremely high. So our, our cost per lead on the Bandit Signs ended up being about $1,000 per lead, which you really just can't make money on. So, you know, that was that was one of the things that, that didn't really work well. The other things that, that we try that don't work super well um, is um, I'm pretty anti-driving for dollars. So I did a lot of driving for dollars. And what I found after doing it a lot is that I've never seen much of a correlation between somebody who has a property that's in beat up condition and versus somebody that actually wants to sell to an investor. Mm. And driving for dollars takes up so much time. You're basically doing all this research to get somebody who you then can contact when you could just start out by contacting them. And so right. I, think in the I think in the beginning, that was a mistake I made a lot of where it was like, if I was going to cold call somebody, like I spent an hour of research before I identified who I was going to call. Whereas today I'm broadcasting out thousands and thousands of calls. And yeah, some of those people aren't going to want to sell, but I don't care. I, I want to get out as many calls as I can instead of doing the research up front. Right. Right. And there's, there's different approaches to driving for dollars. I know uh, having some friends in Boston yeah. as well that they just said people are, I think, I think this is what somebody said before is like door knocking would be like a huge no, no in, in Boston, right. <laughs> Compared to maybe other markets. Right. I mean, people are, uh, I mean, it just, sometimes people will tolerate things different in different markets. I'd say in the South, people are a little more to like knock on a door. How are you doing? Come in and have some iced tea and talk to me. I don't even know what you want, but, and then in, you could imagine in the Northeast, people are a little bit more like short, right? Like just, what do you want? Maybe, I don't know. I'm making that stuff up, but probably less no, no, you're 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 right but but door knocking works the problem okay. with door knocking is that most people won't do it right, so right. it's it's one of those marketing methods where like 
the I the only time I've been successful with it is when I was the person who door knocked. And me as the business owner, I don't really have time to door knock. Right. So I actually went through a phase where I hired a bunch of people to actually do the door knocking for me. And I gave them a route and I gave them a map and we had a tracking system to see if they actually knocked on the door. Like I would have them take a picture of something they would leave behind. But the issue is that in, in the Boston market, and this is probably true everywhere, but in the Boston market specifically, when the snowstorms start coming, people don't want to be outside walking around anymore. <laughs> right. So it became, it became a job like the door knocking itself. It, for, for it to be profitable, proper, profitable for me, I couldn't pay a lot per hour, but people weren't willing to do the work for that low of a cost. Yeah. So, um, again, it, it, door knocking definitely works, but it's not something that I really suggest for most people to do because it's a hard thing to kind of expand out on a bigger level. Right, right. So what are you doing now, uh, Tom, that does work? What are some of the things you're doing that you want to share today that are working for you? So the three things that work really well that I think work across all markets and then anyone could implement very easily would be cold calling, internet marketing, and mailing. With mailing being my least favorite of the three as of today, because mailing is the most common and it's the lazy person's way of marketing. So it's the most saturated. Yeah. Yeah, we we have this discussion all the time with people that I coach and mentor is that even when you're mailing, the more broad or cheap, because sometimes people are, they want cheap and easy, right? When you started real estate investing, mm -hmm. so you're like, people say, well, just go after the uh, absentee owners with high equity. It's like, okay, well, that's yep. a huge list, but those lists mm -hmm. might cost you three to five, you know, maybe seven to 10 cents, depending on how many, where you're buying it from. And but if you get some specialty lists, those might be 40, 50 cents a record. So I think basically the more expensive the list is to get to, or the harder it is to get to, um, the less competition you have, right? Because the competition and the gurus out there and everything, they're teaching the cheap stuff. Like, oh, just go, you know, get the two cent a, a, two cent a record list. And it's like, yeah, but that's just crap. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, there's no doubt that the stuff that's harder to do and the stuff that's more expensive to do, you tend to do better over time because you've got less competition there. Exactly. So what we actually do is the most expensive of all, which is build our own database. So we have certain variables that, you know, we have a, we have a property profile that we like. So we know what types of properties will make us the most money. And we have a seller profile that we like. So just to give you an example on the seller profile, we know that on average, most sellers are gonna be over the age of 50 that sell to an investor. Now that doesn't mean that someone under the age of 50 can't sell to an investor. But again, when we are targeting, we wanna make sure that we're, we're marketing to the people that are most likely to sell to us. And we wanna to market to the people, to the homes that we wanna buy. So like yeah. if, you, if you target, for example, just an absentee owner list, well, you're gonna be mailing or calling or putting ads up in front of people whose houses you probably don't even wanna buy. So mm -hmm. we go the reverse way. We say, what houses do we want to buy? What are the de what's the demographic information of the of the people that are going to sell to us? And let's market to those people over and over and over again until they either sell to us or they sell to somebody else. And that's the method that we use. It's the most expensive, but it's it's the biggest ROI overall. Right, right. So, and from a from a criteria, it's not that you have to give us your detailed criteria, but over the age of fifty, you're yeah. looking for houses that are clearly not new, right? You're looking for houses that are older that had had a chance to become distressed, I assume, right? Exactly. So in in Boston, the the average property was built between 1880 and 1920, which is older than you know Boston's an old town. Right. So anything built anything built after 1960. Is kind of new for Boston, so yeah. so we are not marketing to to any houses that are they're built after 1960, and okay. so we're looking at assessed we're looking at things like assessed values too, because I like to be in the the median to lower end of every market because I feel like that's the most amount of buyers, and so for each kind of like filter that we put on, it takes out a certain you know amount of the population, and then we have a database in the Boston market of essentially every house that we wanna buy. And those are the people that we're continuing to market to, like I said, 
they're either going to sell to us at some point or they're going to sell to somebody else, but we're going to be in front of them when they are going to make that decision. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So let's dive into, so we kind of went over the criteria. I guess these are criteria you use for, for mailing, but let's, let's start with what you said your favorite was, which is something that's becoming more and more popular these days. We're hearing more people talk about it is uh, cold calling, actually cold calling yeah. prospective sellers, really their homeowners that you're trying to find out where they'd be interested in selling. Right. So share some more about that. So it's the same database. So when I say that we're reaching out to them and we're in front of them forever, we're in front of them via calling, via mailing, and on the internet, on Facebook and Google, until they end up selling to us or selling to somebody else. So when we call, the person's also received letters from us. The person has also seen us on Facebook, and they've also maybe seen us on Google if they're searching for the right key terms. So we're calling the same people. But the important thing about, there's a couple of important things when it comes to calling. The first is essentially how you kind of go up the ladder which meaning like you're having the person that you're paying the least amount of money doing the lowest level priority task. And then as you need more skills, you're going up the ladder. So for example, the people that are doing my initial calling, they're, they're the lowest dollar per hour. And then all their job is at the very beginning stages of us cold calling is to call as many people as possible and just to identify if the person might consider an offer. Once they say, yes, I might consider an offer, then it goes up the ladder to somebody else who has more skills. And so that that person is an inside sales agent for me. They can have a more in-depth conversation on like what we do, what we offer, what types of houses we like to buy, how it might be beneficial to them. And then once the inside sales agent has that conversation and the seller is willing to meet with us, now it's going to an acquisition specialist on my team who can go out there and meet them and actually get the deal closed. Okay. So from that initial call, are you, are they mentioning in any way uh, that they're a disc, that you're a discount buyer, or are they just seeing if they're interested in selling at all? They're just interested in selling. And the, the reason for that is because I have 150 person real estate brokerage. So a lot of the people that are acquisition specialists on my team are also agents. I see. And so we can help the sell. Yeah, we can help this. If they want to sell, we can help them, you know, okay. and when we go out there, we're going to, we're going to usually help them make the determination of whether or not it makes sense to sell to an investor or whether it makes sense to sell traditionally. And yep. for most people, it makes sense to sell traditionally and that's okay. We, we want to do what's in the best interest of that particular um, seller. We help them kind of determine what that is. And then, you know, hopefully if we do a good job of providing value, they'll end up working with us. That's awesome. So can you, can you maybe share a little bit about how you build your database? So you, you start with us. Uh, I mean, you, you start with addresses, I guess, some criteria. So you're pulling this from yes. public records probably initially, and then you have to append yes. stuff to it. Like, okay. Correct. Exactly. So there's a lot of appending. So we start out with, with, um, we go into our MLS database, the, the public record, and then we export the initial um, set of records. And then we just keep on appending to that. Meaning, uh, well, we filter, like there's some stuff you can filter in the MLS and there's some stuff you can't. So we filter as much as we can right out of the gate in the MLS, but then we add other filters to it, which we do outside of the MLS. And then when you're talking about appending data, like we're appending uh, email records, cell phone records, um, and any other data that we need to know about the person, like, you know, date of birth and anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So that's how you, uh, we haven't talked, well, let's, let's kind of get into the next step, which is online advertising. And and I know before this, you said you liked Facebook. So my, the question I always mm -hmm. have with Facebook, cause we do a lot of marketing for flip nerd and for our businesses and stuff. We don't really, yep. mo we don't advertise for sellers right now on Facebook other than retargeting, which is kind of a logical step. Hey, they visited my site. They've expressed some interest. So we're retargeting them because the challenge I would say typically on Facebook is that you, unlike Google, where somebody's searching for key words, they're looking for you maybe, right? But on Facebook, it's hard to know that, hey, mom, my mom just died last week. By the way, mom, if you're watching this, I'm not <clears> talking about you. So basically, mom just died last week and, yeah. uh, you know, dad's in a nursing home and I'm motivated. Like that just doesn't come up on Facebook, but I know that you can 
target people based on IP address, based on their address? Or are you using that information to kind of upload and target IPs based on the houses that are in your database that you've already decided you wanted to buy? No, we're not. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I, I know exactly what you're saying. And, and I don't even think what you're talking about doing would be possible. Like to, so, so on Facebook, the negative of Facebook is that you're basically interrupting someone doing something else. So with Google, the benefit is they go on Google, they type sell my house fast, Boston, they're looking for you. So that is a higher quality, more expensive lead. On Facebook, they're basically looking to see pictures of their friends and their family, and you're throwing up an ad in front of them that's saying, hey, you know, you wanna sell your house fast in seven days, click here. But even though the leads are not quite as high quality, you're gonna get a lot more of them for your, for your dollar. So when we look at leads in general, we look at the cost per acquisition. So I don't care really about the cost per lead because I can get I can get ten dollar home valuation leads, but they're all garbage. So I need thousands and thousands of home valuation leads in order to buy a house. Right. And then on, on Google, when somebody goes in and they say sell my house fast or sell my house fast for cash, those leads are super expensive, but they're really good leads. So right. we look and say, okay, how many Facebook leads does it take to get a deal? And am I profitable on that? spend. So if I'm spending five or six or seven or eight thousand dollars on, on Facebook ads, what's my ROI? And as long as my ROI is positive and it's you know comparable to my other lead sources, then we're gonna we're gonna go after it. So on on Facebook, you are able to filter. So Facebook knows everything about you. They know how old you are, they know your marital status, they know your job, they know what you like, they know what you don't like. So the cool thing about Facebook is like, if you're a real estate investor, you're not seeing my ad. If you're a real estate agent, you're not seeing my ad. If you're not a homeowner, you're not seeing my ad. So Facebook does have a lot of information about people where you can yeah. get pretty targeted. Now you are gonna reach some people on Facebook that you know maybe you don't wanna buy their house, but again, the cost per lead is lower, so it's a good value. Sure, sure. I see. I see. Awesome. So you're not targeting, uh, cause you can also upload email addresses and target people that way. I know yes. you said you try to append email address. So there's some other, which are not perfect. I mean, but, um, there, I think, you know, who knows where Facebook will be even two years from now, right. Or what other social network will pop up. But yeah, I saw some, I saw some funny like marketing cartoon where I, I, I'm not going to do a good idea of explaining it, but like it's getting to the point where like all the ads that we see on a day to day basis now are so targeted specifically to us because these companies know so much about us now. So yeah. like every, you know, in the future, we're going to see ads that are like literally talking specifically to us, you know, like, yeah. hey, Tom in Boston, you know, like, and it's getting to that point where everything that we see now is so targeted and it's nice from an advertiser's perspective because you can put the right ad in front of the right person. So you don't have, like going back 10 years, if you wanted to do a TV ad, you're putting a message out in front of a bunch of people who you know they have no interest in your product or service, right. but you still have to pay, you still have to pay to reach all those people where now you can get super targeted and you can only show the ad to the people who are your most, you know, like motivated clientele and right. only pay to show it in front of those people. Right, right. So with online, um, so you're you're primarily doing, I guess you're doing both Google, your AdWords and Facebook advertising. Is that primarily what you're doing? Yeah, in some SEO, but I always hesitate to say too much about SEO because most people think like, I'm gonna get a website and I'm gonna start generating SEO leads in a month or two months. And the reality is, is it just takes a long time. And yeah. even once the SEO starts working, someone can bump you, you know, like a, a position or two down and you don't have like all that much control over it. So right. we do get a bunch of SEO leads, but like when someone's first starting out, I'm like, don't even think about SEO because you're maybe a year away from generating your first lead. Yeah, 
Yeah, for sure. Um, and so let's talk, and then by the way, even if you become proficient at SEO, like Google could change their algorithm and you're just, that's what I'm saying. You know, you have no the next control. week you're just, everything goes away. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's one thing for certain is there will always be a way to spend advertising dollars to advertise and you'll always have more control over what that gets what that gets you ultimately. So I guess yeah. that's why even even though nobody likes to pay for advertising, it's like at least it's predictable. Uh not not completely predictable, but more predictable, right? So But I like to spend money on marketing because at the end of the day, it's like it's the easiest way to leverage yourself. So right. like when, when you're trying to do stuff to generate leads, spending your own time, I mean, your time's the only resource that you don't get back. So, right. you know, you can spend, as long as you're getting, if I, if I'm spending marketing money and I'm giving you a dollar and you're giving me $2 back, I'm going to keep spending that dollar until I can't get that $2 back anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, Tom. Well, we're kind of coming up on the end of our show here. What, what, what advice would you give the people that are looking to get started or that are already started in real estate investing, but they're kind of, they haven't really cracked the code on advertising here? Where, where do they kind of start? Because I know we talked about direct mails where most people start. The cold calling thing is not complicated, but it's it's a process that you have to learn, right? And then direct mail is, uh, is you know, becoming easier than it has been in the past, but there's still a learning curve there as well. But where, where would you kind of suggest people start? If you don't have any money, I would suggest starting with cold calling because you can do that for almost nothing. The Mojo dialer, which is a three line dialer is 150 bucks a month. If you're gonna pay, I would start with either Facebook or Google and start with a marketing budget that you can afford and then scale up from there. But I would always recommend if you're an investor, get your real estate license because most of the, the people that say that they're motivated to sell are still going to sell traditionally. So why not capitalize on that lead regardless of how they're going to sell? So I always recommend like get your real estate license as soon as you can in the beginning and you'll get a bigger ROI on everything that you do in real estate. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, and Tom, if folks want to learn more about you, about some of the stuff you're working on, where, where would they go to find you? The best way is just to go to my website directly, which is um, www.realestateinvestingiseasy.com. Again, that's www.realestateinvestingiseasy.com. And that actually has my best training video, which kind of goes over in more detail some of the stuff that we've talked about today. Okay. Awesome. We'll add a link down below for down below the video here for anybody that's interested. And uh, thanks for spending time with us today. Yeah, it was good. Good stuff. I think the important thing is if you're listening to this and if you got overwhelmed, you know, just uh, the intent is not to overwhelm you. Uh, but the key is really is to get started. So you don't have to start with all these things. And like Tom said, you know, no. if you don't have a lot of money, you can start with start with cold calling and just dialing people. Uh, you could start with direct mail with a relatively low budget. Um, and you can start online. I mean, online is easier to do. I'm not a big advocate of, of people that have no knowledge there going to kind of just start to figure that out themselves, but there are some easy ways to kind of get started uh, on a low budget online as well. So awesome. Well, everybody, thanks for joining us today. This is uh, episode number 358, and uh, we're going to kind of keep our episodes rolling at you here. We've got, by the way, if you haven't listened to our, our other podcast, REI Classroom, I think we have over 700 episodes uh, of that show. So we've got uh, over a thousand episodes of different shows ready for you on flipner.com or in the iTunes store. Everybody, thanks for joining us and we will see you again next week. Take care. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the flipner.com investing show. If you're not yet an elite member of Flipnerd, you're missing out. We have tons of great training, including a new detailed master class published each month and live training webinars with experts twice a month. Plus you'll get access to all of our archives where we already have a growing library of master classes and other training videos. Elite members also get membership in our incredible online mastermind group where many of the top real estate investors from across the country, including many of the hundreds of guests I've had on the show in the past are already members. Whether you're brand new looking to get started, or a veteran, you simply must join today. I promise you won't be disappointed. To learn more or join today, please visit flipnerd.com slash lab. That's flipnerd.com slash 
lab. See you on the next show.